Man has always been fascinated by the depths of the oceans. Water has that something that attracts us, that frightens us, and amazes us at the same time. And for good reason, it is the most present substance on Earth, and along with air, the main ingredient that allows life as we know it. Water covers more than 70% of the Earth's surface, while 95% of these waters have not yet been explored. This fascination for the abyss, many people have used it to shape various myths and legends, such as that of the lost city of Atlantis. According to this legend, an inhabited city would be today completely buried under the sea after having been buried by a huge tidal wave more than 9,000 years ago. Today, it is not Atlantis that we are going to talk about, but an eighth continent that exists scientifically as a land, a place that you may have already visited in part without knowing it. It is Zealandia. Before we take you on a tour of Zealandia, then and now, it is important to go back to where it all began, geologically speaking, because another supercontinent existed before. This is the story of the last of a race of geological titans, a supercontinent called Gondwana. Dear Traveler, Good morning. Today we are going to explore the mysteries of our planet Earth in search of the forgotten continent, Zealandia. Before leaving for a new adventure, remember to like the video and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss anything. Thank you, and have a nice trip! At the end of the Etikaran period, some 500 million years ago, the Earth was very different. Tectonic movements brought together Africa, South America, Australia, Antarctica, India, the Arabian Peninsula, and Madagascar. Almost to the South Pole, this was the first version of Gondwana. The climate was mild at that time, because the world was warmer. Multicellular organisms had developed, but they were primitive. Many fossils were found showing segmented worms, round jellyfish-like creatures, and sling-like organisms. Over time, other continents collided with this first Gondwana land to form Pangaea, the whole Earth, approximately 300 million years ago. Pangaea was gigantic. The entire continental mass of the planet was merged into a single block, dominating the southern hemisphere, surrounded by the largest ocean in history. 20 to 70 million years later, plumes of magma from the Earth's core began to burn through the crust like a blowtorch, creating a rift between what we now know as Africa, South America, and North America. Convection cells associated with these plumes expanded the rift into a new ocean, Tethys, dividing the northern supercontinent called Laurasia, comprising North America, Europe and Asia today from the southern supercontinent, our fully formed Gondwana land. The latter loses some of its original parts to Laurasia, such as Florida and parts of Georgia, but it still contains all the land masses we see today in the southern hemisphere. And the beginnings of Zealandia are already here. Here we are in the land of Zealandia. If you have in mind New Zealand and New Caledonia today, the scenery is quite different back then. Yet on closer inspection, there are still some similarities, elements of nature that have survived the passage of time. Was modern man present? No, none of the representatives of our species was in place to witness it. The masters of the land, those who ruled Zealandia at that time, were the dinosaurs. 
the most imposing creatures that the Earth has ever sheltered, walk the surface of the continent. Remarkably diverse, predators and prey inhabit Zealandia's... At the time, Zealandia enjoys a subtropical climate. Its hot season is long. As for the cold seasons, they are much milder than in the temperate zones and are accompanied by some rainfall. Fauna and flora abound on the continental block. There is an exponential growth of forests, which combined with the humid climate creates a warm environment conducive to life. This is why the anosaurs manage to feed on the tall conifers. Diplodocus doesn't struggle to reach these heights thanks to its size, which can reach 25 meters or 82 feet into the more difficult to reach food. Despite its imposing size, it competes with the Brachiosaurus, which has the same morphology with a large neck. But the abundance of vegetation allows each of them to feed. These herbivores fear a whole category of carnivorous predators from the theropod family, including ceratosaurs, megalosaurs, and allosaurs. The latter is the nightmare of a large number of species and is recognized as a ferocious creature at that time. Most of the allosaurs reached 8 meters long or 26 feet long, which does not prevent them from attacking much larger animals such as Diplodocus or Brachiosaurs. Their huge jaws with crenellated and curved teeth allow them to tear off huge chunks of flesh. And even if they lose one in battle, it grows back quite quickly. Its massive body is supported by its limbs and its tail, which serves as a balance to balance its body during its movements. Its limbs are equipped with claws which makes it easier to skin. The seas encompass a great variety of ecological niches, which induces a great diversity of food. Thus, a large number of different animal species could feed. Fish and marine reptiles are the most represented. The Liopleurodon is one of the most fearsome marine predators, this rather slender reptile can measure up to 7 meters, or 23 feet, which makes it one of the largest marine creatures of the time, with a weight that can reach 50 tons. It has large teeth of 20 centimeters, or 8 inches, and four extremely powerful fins, allowing it to swim quickly and to attack creatures of imposing size. Its nostrils, placed at the level of its skull, allow it to detect the odors of its potential preys at a distance of kilometers. This giant is at the top of the food chain. Alongside the Liopleurodon, the ichthyosaurs, similar to today's dolphins, swim in the seabed. They measure between 1 and 10 meters and are able to propel themselves through the water at a speed of up to 40 kilometers per hour thanks to their fins. They must come to the surface to breathe atmospheric air. They feed on fish, eggs, ammonites, and belemnites that they catch with their long snout and sharp teeth. The plesiosaur also lives alongside these creatures in the waters. This aquatic diapsid vertebrate has a rare characteristic. It is equipped with four fins in the shape of paddles giving it a flight effect and making it more comfortable in underwater maneuvers. Between 1.5 and 15 meters long, that is to say, between 5 and 50 feet, the plesiosaur has a large body and a short tail. Its long neck allows them to use its head as a harpoon and catch its prey from a distance. In the seas, invertebrates are represented by rudists. Plankton and ammonites are widespread. The rudists are marine bivalve mollusks. That is to say that their body is covered with a shell, consisting of two distinct parts. They live in warm and oxygenated waters, therefore shallow. 
Among the plankton, dinoflagellates are numerous and diversified thanks to their feeding behavior. These aquatic microorganisms can be heterotrophic, mixotrophic, or photosynthetic. They play a regulatory role in the population of microalgae by transferring nutrients for a large number of living beings. Ammonites are a group of marine animals from the class of cephalopod mollusks. Their shell is spiral-shaped, with the last compartment occupied by the animal. The other lodges are used to control the flotation, thanks to a siphon. They can measure from a few millimeters to more than two meters or seven feet in diameter. Although they are related to Nautilus, they are also represented in nature today by organisms with heads equipped with tentacles such as octopuses, squids, or cuttlefish. Ammonites move in the water by whole schools. Their biggest predator is the mosasaur, a voracious creature of 15 meters or 50 feet long that has an excellent sense of smell and follows its prey. In the air, the pterosaurs are the dominant group. It is believed that these creatures were the first vertebrates to fly. They are related to the family of diapsid archosaurs, or nithodorids, and are not dinosaurs and therefore not birds. Their broad wings are composed of patagium, a skin membrane like that of bats. Some species are covered with down, their size varies greatly depending on the specimen. The Nemicolopterus has a size equivalent to a sparrow. Others, like the Quetzalcoatlus, have no equivalent in size in the modern world. This creature with a wingspan reaching more than 12 meters or more than 40 feet, the size of a small plane, weighs more than 300 kilograms, that is to say, more than 660 pounds, Pterosaurs are oviparous and are quadrupedal when they are on the ground. Their diet is very varied. They eat insects, fish, but also shellfish. There is a kind of pterosaur that impresses by its dragon-like appearance. It is Fapungaka Shawi. It is one of the largest creatures that could fly on Earth, with a wingspan of up to 7 meters. Its back legs are short and its skull, measuring one meter long, ends with a spear-shaped snout, decorated with about 40 sharp teeth. This carnivore fed mainly on fish. The species is characterized by an imposing bony crest at the level of the lower jaw, which had to play a role in its flight dynamics. The hot and humid climate participates in the proliferation of an abundant flora, which covers a large part of the lands of Zealandia. The forests are full of conifers and aracarias, pinacae, podocarpacae, and taxiodacae. These species belong to the gymnosperms, which means that they produce naked seeds that are not enclosed in a fruit. The ecosystems of these rainforests constitute significant natural habitats at the time. The Aracaria genus reached its maximum expansion at the time of Zealandia. It is now the oldest conifer in the world and the most phylogenically primitive. These trees colonize steep but sunny slopes in spaced populations. They have a geometrical aspect due to their branches arranged in a regular cross. They are covered with scales on the branches, but also on the trunk. At the beginning, the young tree does not grow, but then it will grow 30 centimeters or 11 inches per year, and will take a pyramidal shape that will round with age until it forms a dome. Seed plants such as tails are found in lower latitudes, Characterized by a thick trunk, their leaves are similar to the imposing leaves of cicas. 
Alongside them, we find ferns, such as tree ferns, or Dixonia antarctica, and ginkgos. The latter are a kind of plants without flowers. They have a very long lifespan, since they can live more than 1,000 years, and are adapted to light soils. They reach an average height of 25 meters, or 80 feet. Its bark is smooth at first, then cracks and splits over time, and turns a brown-gray color. It has peculiar and unique leaves, formed by two lobes that resemble palms without a central vein. The Dixonia antarctica, on the other hand, is a primitive fern. Its massive trunk is a kind of rhizome, an underground stem with roots, which can reach 15 meters or 50 feet in height, even though it grows slowly. Some dinosaurs feast on its leaves. Horse tails are also widespread in these dense and diverse jungles. They are, at the time, much larger than the horsetail species that evolve in the modern world, reaching between 8 and 10 meters, or up to 30 feet, against 20 to 50 centimeters, or 20 inches, for today's horsetails. This perennial plant presents leaves, posed like collars, at the level of the nodes of the stems and the branches. It thrives in moist environments. Nature and ecosystems seem to have found a balance for a few million years, but the last supercontinents are now on the verge of separating, and Zealandia will undergo a surprising evolution. The cause? Plate tectonics. However, the breakup did not happen all at once. Gondwana broke up step by step, over millions and millions of years. About 180 million years ago, African and modern South America began to separate from the rest of Gondwana land. They remained merged for about 30 to 40 million years, until the South Atlantic Rift divided them opening the ocean, of the same name which separates them. This is why the eastern coasts of South America and the western coast of Africa seem to fit together perfectly. It was at approximately the same time that the South Atlantic Rift opened, and the easternmost part of the continent, Madagascar and India, separated from the rest, opening the central Indian Ocean. The two continents remained together until the end of the Cretaceous. Then India slowly moved towards Eurasia. The collision between the two continents was so aggressive that it gave birth to the Himalayas a few million years later. In the meantime, about 100 million years ago, during the development of the Pacific Ring of Fire, a zone of volcanic activity surrounded the Pacific Ocean. Tectonic forces began to stretch the Zealandia block. The forces put into action are such that its crust thins until it is completely torn off the supercontinent, Gondwana. This is the process of rifting. The Tasman Sea is formed at this time. At this point, all that remains of the former Gondwana is Australia and Antarctica, too little to be called a supercontinent. Nevertheless, they remained together until 45 million years ago. Antarctica then moved south and froze under the combined effect of climate cooling and the movement of ocean currents around the new land masses. Australia drifted northward, colliding with South Asia. But Zealandia's journey to the abyss did not end there. The continent is now 94% submerged under the surface of the Pacific Ocean. New Zealand and New Caledonia remain as landmasses. What happened to get there? Zealandia went underwater about 80 million years ago, but perhaps not in its entirety 
and perhaps other subsequent events caused it to reappear and submerge again. The only thing we can be sure of is that man has never seen this continent above the waves, except for the islands of New Zealand and New Caledonia. During the next 40 million years, Zealandia drifted and continued its descent until it stabilized in its current position on the ocean floor. Eventually, an oceanic plate protruded from the continental crust of Zealandia, forming the Grand Tear. Then, New Caledonia emerged as a result of local crustal thickening. In the case of New Zealand, it is the result of a collision similar to that between the Pacific Oceanic Plate and the South American Continental Plate. By folding and volcanism, part of the oceanic crust is subducted under the continental crust. This is how its mountains were born. When, approximately 50 million years ago, which would have contributed to the thinning of the crust of Zealandia. The continental and oceanic plates have different crustal compositions and thicknesses. Under some mountains, the continental crust can be as much as 100 kilometers or 60 miles thick. On average, the continental crust is 35 kilometers or 20 miles thick. Granitic and metamorphic rocks and sedimentary rocks are found mainly in the crust. Basalt and gabbro make up the oceanic crust, which averages 7 kilometers or 4 miles thick. Due to the movements of plate tectonics, oceanic plates sink by subduction into the mantle, on which they float because they are denser than continental plates. As can be seen in the Andes Mountains, a collision with a continent can lead to the formation of mountains. This plate can also slide over a continent, giving rise to Ophiolite complexes such as those in New Caledonia. The continents are too light and too thick to plunge into the mantle and disappear there, so they preserve a small part of the Earth's history with rocks that can be at least 4 billion years old, while the oceanic plates, heavier because of their density, can only have a maximum of 200 million years before being recycled into the Earth's mantle. On the other hand, when a supercontinent breaks up, a small portion of the continental crust at the edge of the rift thins out like hot metal over a few hundred kilometers as was the case when the Atlantic Ocean opened up. When its thickness is less than 30 kilometers or 20 miles, it becomes a sediment-covered continental shelf and passes below ocean level. Today, the only remnants of the continent Zealandia are the islands of New Zealand and New Caledonia. Only 5% of its surface is visible above sea level. Before we take you to visit these lands, let's see how they were discovered. James Cook was the first navigator and explorer to map the South Seas, as well as Australia and New Zealand. With a courageous and ambitious temperament, adventurer and humanist at heart, James Cook was a great sailor willing to go beyond any limit ever crossed before. His discoveries were invaluable in enriching our knowledge of the Pacific Ocean. In 1768, James Cook was appointed commander of the Endeavour and was about to embark on three successive expeditions in the Pacific Ocean. He began by sailing all the way around New Zealand, then the east coast of Australia, and then tried to approach the Antarctic continent in order to study Easter Island. He discovered the Hawaiian Islands, the first part of his journey consisted in observing Tahiti and the passage of the planet Venus on the disk of the Sun, a rare phenomenon 
scheduled for June 3, 1769. However, as far as Zealandia is concerned, it is the second expedition of James Cook that will mark the beginning of this myth. The captain was ordered to search for the mythical Terra Australis, the Antarctic continent, previously unknown. In 1769, the British reached New Zealand, which had previously been discovered by Abel Tasman in 1642, but had not been explored at the time. James Cook made an extremely detailed map, including the two islands separated by the strait that bears the explorer's name today. He states, Imagine a typical continent at seemingly endless land in all directions. There are wide valleys and highlands, open vistas of rolling plains and towering mountain ranges in the distance. And there can be canyons, valleys, gorges, great depressions and basins. Now imagine that same continent under the sea and largely drowned. He is actually talking about Zealandia, but no one knew that at the time. New Zealand's landmass straddles its center, and to the north, New Caledonia marks its visible tropical end. Research will be done during the 20th century, but it was only in 2017 that an international team, Expedition 371, confirmed the existence of this eighth continent, named Zealandia, or Te Rio Amu. The research conducted showed that this microcontinent is partially composed of rocks that are more than one billion years old. This nine-week mission was conducted by the research vessel Joids Resolution in the southwestern Pacific as part of the International Ocean Discovery Program. The scientists' goal was to try to understand what makes Zealandia so unique. The 5 million square kilometers of what is considered the world's 8th largest continent were probed for two months. But unlike the other seven continents of the Earth, or six depending on how you look at it, most of Zealandia, 94% to be precise, is underwater. To understand and map it, it has taken considerable investigation, using a whole range of scientific tools and centuries of accumulated knowledge. But its remnants, New Zealand and New Caledonia, are clearly visible. New Zealand consists of two main islands, the South Island and the North Island, but also 700 other small islands. It is separated from Australia which is about 2,000 kilometers, or 1,200 miles away, by the Tasman Sea, and is also about 1,000 kilometers, or 620 miles from New Caledonia. Tectonic uplift and volcanic eruptions have created a variety of landforms and mountain peaks. Because of its remoteness, New Zealand is the last large landmass to have been discovered and settled by man. With a total area of 268,680 square kilometers, or 167,000 square miles, New Zealand has 15,134 kilometers, or 9,300 miles of coastline, surrounded by the Pacific Ocean. The immense forests that once largely covered Zealandia are now giving way to vast plains where sheep flourish. The Maori started the deforestation, and then the Westerners continued in order to gain more grazing land. In contrast to its rather dry neighbor Australia, New Zealand has a green countryside. This is because the country is located in the axis of the Roaring Forties, latitudes in the Southern Hemisphere, where the wind is powerful because it is not slowed down by the land. The land is frequently watered by rain, and volcanic activity has given relief to the plains and valleys. 
despite deforestation, the forest still covers a large area on both islands. 600 species of trees and plants are listed, including a large variety of ferns, which were already widely present on Zealandia, hence the choice of the fern as the national emblem of New Zealanders. Despite its rather low latitude, and thanks to a microclimate, the country has beautiful Nikos palms growing, which contributes to give the country an exotic image. The Pohutukawa and the Kari are major representatives of the New Zealand vegetation. The Pohutukawa is also called the Christmas tree of New Zealand. It likes to grow on volcanic soils located on the seashore. This large tree, with very hard wood, reaches 15 to 20 meters in height, that is to say, up to 50 feet high. It has dark grayish green leaves, and just before the end of the year, it puts on red flowers in the shape of pom-poms. The kauri is a conifer that can reach more than 50 meters high. It is one of the oldest trees in the world, since it began to spread in the Jurassic period. It was already present when Zealandia was completely emerged. The age of the oldest Karis in New Zealand is estimated at 2,000 years. This conifer is characterized by a gigantic trunk diameter that can exceed 3 meters. The oldest trees are figures of divinity for the Maori. In the Waipua forest in Northland, Kane Mahuta, over 1,200 years old, stands at 51.2 meters, or 168 feet tall. This tree is said to be the Lord of the Forest, son of Mother Earth and Father Sky. These two loved each other so much that the universe was suffocating in their embrace. Thanks to the birth of their son, the Earth separated from the sky, and light and life sprang forth. For the Maori tribe, this legend is that of creation. The South Island has almost inaccessible wilderness areas. The rainforests are crossed by trails that are best followed. It is also shaped by a mountain range located on its western part and forming a natural border along its length. The South Island Alps were formed only two million years ago as a result of geological folding that is still going on. This mountain range lies on a fault line where the Pacific Plate collides with the Australian Plate. Over the past 45 million years, subduction of the Pacific Plate has pushed 20 kilometers or 12 miles of crust under the Australian Plate. Subjected to tectonic pressure, the mountains persist in rising. Each year, although erosion does its work, the mountain continues to gain a few millimeters. The highest peak in this Southern Alps range is Araki, or Mount Cook, with a peak elevation of 3,724 meters, or 12,200 feet, above sea level and it continues to gain 7 millimeters in elevation each year. In New Zealand, there are more than 200 peaks of about 2,300 meters or 7,500 feet in altitude, with about 20 of them even exceeding 3,000 meters or 10,000 feet. The North Island is patterned with mountains that are actually volcanoes of the Great Pacific Ring of Fire. This alignment of volcanoes borders the Pacific Ocean for about 40,000 kilometers or 25,000 miles, where several tectonic plate boundaries and faults are located. Most of these volcanoes are still active, and the region has considerable geothermal activity, with boiling mud pools, sulfur pools, and geysers, this volcanic activity also has an impact on the surrounding environment, as with the Emerald Lakes, 
which are lakes that fill explosion craters, whose brilliant color is due to the minerals that line their bottom. Since the continent Zealandia has been submerged, New Zealand is lined with 15,000 kilometers or 9,300 miles of beach. On the west coast, some are typically marked by volcanic activity and lava flowing into the ocean as it offers a black sand landscape. The fauna and flora of New Zealand shares common characteristics with that of New Caledonia, since they were both on the continent Zealandia. Its long-term isolation from the lands of other continents generates a biodiversity with a very high rate of endemism. More recent species are introduced by man, but it remains that 90% of all freshwater fish, 80% of all vascular plants, 70% of all native land and freshwater bird species are found only here, as well as all bats, amphibians, and reptiles. When man first landed in New Zealand, the archipelago's fauna consisted only of bats and two species of marine mammals. However, recent studies during which mandible bones and a femur were discovered prove that mammals must have been present after the separation of Gondwana. The reason why mammals were absent from New Zealand lands for millions of years is still unknown. Several elements of Gondwanan biodiversity are found in New Zealand. As far as fauna is concerned, it is represented by insects, frogs, some birds, and the famous Tautara. The Tautara, also called Sphenodon, is the last living representative of the Sphenodontia class, originating from the distant age of dinosaurs. It is classified as a living fossil which means that it has remained morphologically almost identical throughout its history, more than 200 million years. It is mistakenly associated with lizards because of its appearance, but it is part of an ancient group of Lepidosaurians and has unique characteristics within the reptile group. Although in the days of the dinosaurs this animal had many relatives, it would appear today that this extraordinary New Zealand animal is on a unique branch. The Tautara has changed little since its first steps on Earth. It has simply adapted to the changing climate since in Gondwana, during the Mesozoic era. The climate was much warmer than it is now on the islands around New Zealand. The Sphenodon has a life expectancy of up to 60 years, although some specimens have even reached 111 years. Its growth stops only around 50 years, the males reaching about 60 centimeters, or 24 inches in length, and the females rather 45 centimeters, or 17 inches. It has a greenish-brown color to blend in with its environment, and has the physical appearance of an iguana. The Sphenodon feeds on beetles, spiders, grasshoppers, frogs, but also eggs and seabird chicks. It is occasionally cannibal. Sphenodons reach sexual maturity only at the age of 7 to 13 years. Females lay eggs every 4 years. Their reproduction rate is therefore relatively low. It is now part of the animals threatened with extinction and is the subject of a protection and reintroduction program in the wild. The Sphenodon has a third eye, called parietal, its function remains mysterious, but it seems that it allows the Sphenodon to absorb vitamin D, to find its way in the day and night cycle, but also to help it thermoregulate itself. The local Maoris consider it a divine messenger and have designated it Taonga, a special treasure. It is a symbol of protection, especially for newborns.
The kiwi is a bird species endemic to New Zealand. It is about the size of a chicken, but its atrophied wings have been reduced to stumps through evolution, making it a flightless bird. It is the emblem of the country, and this name is sometimes used to designate the New Zealand population. The most probable hypothesis explaining the arrival of the kiwi in New Zealand is that it arrived from Australia by flying 50 million years ago. It is a shy bird that only comes out at night, which makes it difficult to observe. Like most of the New Zealand fauna, the kiwi is a species threatened by the introduction of other invasive species by the Europeans. Cats, dogs, and opossums are wreaking havoc on the native species. At the time of its arrival on the island, it was devoid of mammals except for the bat. The kiwi, free of predators, has lost its ability to fly over the years. The moas were also faced with this evolution. When it arrived on the lands of New Zealand, this bird species, now extinct, had no predators. Like the kiwi, they evolved and lost the ability to fly. This was without counting on the landing of the great eagles of Haast, which became terrible predators of the moas. Nevertheless, it is the men who will lead the species to its extinction because of the destruction of their nests and hunting. The giant eagles of Haast will become extinct because of the lack of prey to eat. Bats arrived in New Zealand about 20 million years ago. Coming from Australia, they have long fulfilled the role of land mammals. Thanks to them, many plants are fertilized and evolve. They have the particularity to walk on all fours on the ground to search the forest litter in search of food. In the seas swim about 30 species of fish, the majority of which are endemic, i.e. exclusive to this region of the world. They are rather small and discreet, except for three species that exceed two kilos. Many marine mammals also roam the New Zealand coast. Several species of dolphins, such as the bottlenose dolphin or the dusky dolphin, which has beautiful black and white markings. The Hector's dolphin is the only species found only in New Zealand. Gray in color, with white markings on the belly and black on the fins, fin, head and tail, this small dolphin does not exceed 1.5 meters or 5 feet in length. Maui's dolphin, also known as Popato, is a subspecies of Hector's dolphin, and it is the rarest dolphin in the world. Alongside the dolphins, seals and sea lions strut their stuff on New Zealand's vast coastline. Sea lions alternate swimming in the sea to catch fish and resting on the rocks of the beach. Sea lions have a preference for sandy beaches but can also settle in the surrounding vegetation. Seals explore the coastline at high tide in order to find preys. They also appreciate the low tide to bask on the banks. But the trace of Zealandia in the present scenery of New Zealand is undoubtedly Curio Bay a fossilized forest that stretches for about 20 kilometers or 12 miles, a geological curiosity of the first order. Located at the southern tip of the South Island, Curio Bay is one of Zealandia's Jurassic-era relics, a petrified forest dating back about 180 million years is visible when the tide is out. At that time, Zealandia was part of Gondwana, Huge volcanic mudflows covered the trees and ferns of the entire region before being sunk under the ocean for millions of years. The process of petrification of the plants then occurred due to the lack of oxygen transforming the organic matter of the wood into minerals such as quartz, pyrite, or silicates. At the end of the petrification, 
a large part of the anatomical structure of the wood is preserved. The bay was covered by mud flows, but the erosion of the rock by the waves discovered the forest. So today, in Curio Bay, it is possible to walk through this petrified forest that was once roamed by dinosaurs. Yellow-eyed penguins have now taken up residence in the bay. New Caledonia is a group of islands and archipelago surrounded by the Coral Sea and the South Pacific Ocean. Its total area is 18,575 square kilometers, or 11,500 square miles. It is called the Grand Terry. The closest lands to the island are Australia, at 1,400 kilometers, or 870 miles, and New Zealand at 1,477 kilometers, or 918 miles. It has 3,400 kilometers, or 2,100 miles of coastline. New Caledonia has a tropical climate, which will influence its landscape. The islands have relatively warm temperatures, with an average of 23 degrees Celsius, or 73 degrees Fahrenheit over the year, and high humidity between 73 and 81 percent. The east and west coasts are not equally exposed to the winds, so the landscape is different. The east coast is exposed to the prevailing winds and is more humid. It is planted with a strip of immense tropical forests with palm and coconut trees along the coastline squeezed between the mountains and the ocean. In contrast, the west coast is protected from the prevailing winds by the Shan, an ancient mountain range, and is drier. On this side, grassy plains and savanna dress the landscape with the emblematic tree that is the Naoli. Then a series of hills and plateaus with dry forests rise towards the mountains. The coastline was once dominated by mangroves, tropical trees that thrived along the seashore, but excessive salinity in the water caused their death. Since then, mangroves have dominated. Grand Terre is a mountain that was formed 30 million years ago during the subduction of the Pacific Plate under the Australian plate. It is made up of two-thirds of sedimentary and volcanic formations dated from the Permian to the Cenozoic, or Tertiary. The last third is formed of ultra-basic rocks. The subsistence of the basement under the weight of the ultra-basic rocks caused the separation of Grand Terry from the volcanic arc of Loyates the Loyalty Islands were built on ancient volcanoes. The volcanism of the Loyalty Arc was formed by the subduction of the Pacific Plate beneath the eastern margin of Zealandia during the Paleocene or Pliocene epoch. When volcanism ceased, the islands sank below sea level, causing the coral reefs to grow and creating a lagoon, then an atoll once the volcanic apparatus was completely submerged. In the Quaternary, some of these atolls and lagoons were raised due to a bulge of the Australian Plate before its subduction under the Pacific Plate, forming the current islands of Ovea, Murray, and Lifu. The vegetation of New Caledonia is strongly marked by the flora of Gondwana at the time of the dinosaurs, which makes it extraordinarily unusual. New Caledonia was born from the continental block Zealandia and was isolated when it broke up. The humid climate changed from temperate to tropical, but the temperatures remain stable. The Gondwanan flora in place before the Cretaceous period remained unchanged with only a few changes, such as the disappearance of thermophilic species during the Ice Ages. 
The massifs were filled with ultra-basic rocks from the Eocene onwards, which are toxic for modern plant species, favoring the maintenance of Gondwanan species. These massifs reach records of endemism with unique species. The current Caledonian flora is almost comparable to Jurassic Park. 80% of the species of Grand Terre are endemic, which represents 3,380 species. Amborella is the oldest flowering plant on the planet. 200 million years ago, the genome of the common ancestor of flowering plants doubled. A part will give birth to the 300,000 current flowering plants, and the other part will make appear Amborella the only survivor of this lineage. Amborella is a monospecific genus which includes only one species. It holds its archaic character in the structure of its wood since its construction reminds that of the fern. Its sap-conducting vessels are imperfect, unlike those of most other plants. With the arrival of Amborella, it is a new mode of reproduction which appeared. The flower is born on a shrub, Dioki, which presents male or female flowers. The shrubs reach two to six meters high. From March to May, Amborella leaves odorless flowers, and the rest of the year are red fruits, each containing a single seed. The columnar pine is one of the 13 species of Araucaria in New Caledonia, out of the 19 known species in the world. The tree is symbolic in Canuck culture and is planted in sacred places on the central alley leading to the main hut and around the homes of high-ranking men. While other Araucarias grow mainly in the south, the columnar species occupies the entire territory. It adapts to different types of soil, schistos, ultra-basic, or limestone. But we find it more particularly on the Island of the Pines. When the island was first approached by James Cook, he quickly noticed the abundant presence of columnar pines with their tall, slender silhouettes, hence the name of the island. The island is an elevated atoll with a peak culminating at 262 meters or 860 feet. New Caledonia is one of only five regions in the world where the genus Nothophagus, a relic beach of the Gondwanan rainforests, is still established. Many of the endemic species are found in humid mountain forests on ultra-basic rock massifs. The seaside forest is composed of trees with dense dark red foliage, but is suffering from urbanization. The Neoli is a typical tree of the island. Even if it has since been introduced in other tropical regions to exploit its wood, it is native to New Caledonia and Australia. It is one of the emblems of the island and the Canucks are attached to it since the New Caledonian soldiers who went to fight in France during the First World War were called Neolai. As far as fauna is concerned, the only indigenous New Caledonian mammal representatives are the Chiropterans, which are the flying foxes and the bats. At the time of the fragmentation of Gondwana, the island had no mammals, the Chiropterans came by air. The flying fox is a mega Chiroptery. It is similar to a bat, but of great size. It is fructivorous and reaches between 60 and 80 centimeters, or 30 inches of scale. Its thin head is reminiscent of a fox, hence its name, Flying Fox. It is a nocturnal animal that is most active at night and can be found hanging upside down in tall trees when not flying. The bat is smaller. Six species are found only in New Caledonia. The other mammals present today 
have all been introduced by man. There are wild pigs from domestic species that have escaped into the bush, cattle with about 100,000 cattle, rats and mice, stowaways from ships, and dogs and cats as domestic animals. The cago is the emblematic bird of New Caledonia. This endemic species occupies the rainforests of Grand Terre. A bird with gray plumage and the size of a chicken, it has two particularities. The first is that, like the kiwi, it does not fly. And the second is its cry, which is more like the barking of a dog, saying kagu than the cry of a bird, hence its name. Before the arrival of man on the great land, the kagu had no predators, so it lost its ability to fly. And as it feeds on worms, snails, and larvae, it does not need to rise into the air. Over time, the kagu stopped flying and eventually lost this ability. However, today, dogs, cats, and wild pigs are a real threat to it, as well as humans who are gradually destroying its natural habitat. The females lay only one egg per year, which makes this species endangered. The Isle of Pines is home to one of the rarest ants in the world, Myrmicia ipicalis. It is also known as the bulldog ant because of its aggressiveness. This rare ancestral species is already extinct on the Grand Terre, but still populates some sites on the Isle of Pines. At the time of Gondwana, Myrmicia epicalis was present everywhere on the planet but it is now threatened by an invasive species, the electric ant. Among the 67 species of lizards and geckos, 59 are endemic. The Rachidactylus leekianus is a totally harmless endemic giant gecko that can reach 40 centimeters or 16 inches in length. The fish and crustaceans of the lakes and rivers are mainly native and endemic. The Galaxius neocaledonicus is a very old species of small freshwater fish living in the lake plains of southern New Caledonia. It is unfortunately on the verge of extinction due to, among other things, the introduction of black bass by fishermen, which is a threat to all local species. Among the endemic fauna which shines by its beauty, the Montrosier blue butterfly is not missing. 38% of the butterfly species present in New Caledonia are found only on the island. Many marine mammals appreciate the living conditions offered by New Caledonia and settle here. Most of them prefer the open sea, but some of them come closer and can also be observed in the lagoons. The sea cow, called Dagong, is a peaceful animal that used to be hunted by Canucks for customary ceremonies. A few hundred individuals live in tropical waters, feeding on phanerogams or marine plants. The humpback whale is present in the lagoons and in the open waters, its migration rhythms the Kanak calendar, and its arrival indicates that the time is right to prepare the yam fields. Dolphins are avid visitors to the interior of the lagoons and to the proximity of the coast, which often leads to unfortunate encounters with fishing nets. The sperm whale lives all year round in the deep waters of New Caledonia, especially on the slopes outside the barrier reefs of Grand Terre. New Caledonia has a wide variety of fish. In the tropical Pacific Ocean, of the 3,000 known species, 1,200 are found around the island. The lagoon is a real paradise for divers. The fishes are located at the reefs or in the lagoons. Because of its position in the Coral Sea, New Caledonia has the longest coral reef in the world, 
but not the largest in area. Many living fossils and organisms of archaic forms are still present, such as nautilus and horseshoe crabs. In the reefs, small and colorful fishes contribute to the splendor of the place. Butterfly fish, often with bright yellow colors, the famous clownfish, or microcanths, flatfish with yellow and black stripes, dance in the waters. Alongside them, larger fish, such as surgeonfish, parrotfish, scorpionfish with their beautiful wing-like fins, moray eels are also part of the party. In the lagoons and offshore, you can see the cane beaks, particularly prized by New Caledonians to make fish salad, the peacocks, with their venomous dorsal spines, but whose flesh is excellent. The whitefish, as for them, are concentrated near the beaches and mangroves. Rays are common in the lagoon, such as the black and blue spotted ray and the leopard ray, a sublime ray that reaches up to two meters long and has a very long tail. In New Caledonia, it is preferable to walk on certain bottoms with good shoes in order to avoid stepping on the stonefish, a fish that is invisible, because it is similar to a stone and whose sting is extremely painful. Sharks are present in great numbers, and even if they impress a lot, they are generally not aggressive. The most visible shark is the gray reef shark, or also called blacktail shark. This species, with a broad rounded snout and large eyes, is often found in shallow waters, less than 60 meters, or 200 feet deep, near coral reefs. The great white shark lives in deep waters, but can occasionally enter the passes or even enter the lagoon. Zealandia is 94% submerged. Of its 4.9 million square kilometers, or 3 million square miles, only 287,200 square kilometers, or 180,000 square miles, are visible above sea level. All the rest is underwater. The major submerged parts are plateaus. Let's take a closer look at these submerged parts. The Lord Howe Plateau. This piece of continental crust extends from southwest New Caledonia to the Challenger Plateau. This plateau covers an area of 1.5 million square kilometers, or 1 million miles, and is located at a depth of between 1,500 and 2,500 meters, i.e. deep to 8,200 feet. It was formed by the expansion of the ocean floor during the Miocene, when Zealandia was located above the Lord Howe hotspot, which was the last volcano to erupt in the chain. The seabed is now mostly sandy, but has some volcanic outgrowths. There are many chorus bulbifrons, a species of fish commonly called jorel. They are very colorful and live in tropical waters, loving rocky bottoms. The Challenger Plateau. This underwater plateau is located in the northwest of New Zealand, with a surface area of about 280,000 square kilometers, or 170,000 square miles. It is 500 to 1,500 meters deep, 5,000 feet. Its bottom is covered by sedimentary rocks, over 3,500 meters, or 11,000 feet thick. Campbell Plateau. The Campbell Plateau is attached to the south of the South Island and supports various islands such as the Auckland Islands and the Bounty Islands. 
Its depth is between 500 and 1,000 meters, i.e. 3,200 feet, and it is drawn with numerous reliefs, some of which emerge from the water's surface, such as Discovery Bank, an ancient volcano that has been eroded. The Norfolk Rift This narrow piece of continental crust lies 2,000 meters or 6,500 feet below the sea surface. The rift connects New Caledonia and New Zealand for 1,400 kilometers or 900 miles long and 100 kilometers or 60 miles wide. It forms the eastern margin of the Zealandia continental block that was liberated from the Australian part of Gondwana between 80 and 75 million years ago, which corresponds to the end of the Cretaceous. The main island of New Caledonia's Grand Terre, as well as the islands that extended to the northwest and southeast, are the apparent parts of the Norfolk Rift that extends south to New Zealand. The Chatham Plateau Located in eastern New Zealand, this plateau is tectonically an extension of the eastern South Island. When it was out of the water, it was topped by numerous volcanoes. Recent research has found fossils dating back to the end of the Mesozoic. The forests were mainly gymnosperms and aracarias and podocarpus, and the plants were of the class Lycopodiopsida. Numerous theropods inhabited this area. This plateau is characterized by impressive depths that can reach 3,000 meters or 10,000 feet, as with the Kermatic Trough. New Zealand and German scientists conducted a six-week mission along the Kermatic Volcano Arc, located 1,000 kilometers or 620 miles northeast of New Zealand's North Island. A real research work on the submarine volcanoes of the Pacific Ocean, some of which rise up to 2,500 meters or 8,200 feet above the seafloor. The study focused on the Kermatic Trough formed by the subduction of the Pacific and Australian plates. This trench measures more than 10,050 meters or 33,000 feet deep. It shelters a particular fauna, with in particular the discovery of a giant amphipod of 35 centimeters or 13 inches, whereas the size of this species is usually around 2.5 centimeters or 1 inch. We also found sea slugs, a family of abyssal marine fish. What if? Zealandia had never sunk under the waves. Let's imagine the current planet Earth with an eighth continent. Ocean currents would change the climate in Australia. The Australian east coast would be much colder without the Tasman Sea to keep it warm. Zealandia's northwestern peninsula could create a rain shadow, making eastern Australia much drier than it already is most of northern Zealandia would be tropical or subtropical forest, with mild winters and hot, humid summers. The flora and fauna would resemble those of Australia. The central and eastern plateaus would be temperate and clothed with volcanoes and upland rivers, providing the perfect environment for the Maori to introduce agriculture upon arrival. The southern regions would be separated from the north and center of the continent by large mountain ranges and would be a cold, dry tundra. Few individuals could then survive in the southern taiga. The southernmost point of Zealandia would be no more than 1,000 kilometers or 620 miles from Antarctica, and the northernmost point would be 1,000 kilometers or 620 miles from Papua New Guinea. The Maori of Aotearoa would not settle on an archipelago of 300,000 square kilometers or 185,000 square miles, 
but on a continent of 5 million square kilometers, or 3 million miles. With the northwestern peninsula so close to Papa and Indonesia, Austronesian colonizers would be within reach of two continents at once, which would make Zealandia a massive target for Indonesians and peaceful islanders. There would be two million square kilometers, or one million square miles of farmland, open to the Austronesians in the north of the continent. They would open up trade links with their homelands, which in turn would open up trade links with the rest of Asia and Europe, linking the Maori to all other civilizations through the future Silk Road. Trade and migration would make the ethnic makeup of the continent more diverse, with Indian and Chinese communities among others. If Zealandia had never disappeared under the waters, it would now have almost as many inhabitants as the United States, 350 million or more, and would also be a rising economic, industrial, and military superpower. The demographics of the continent would become more diverse than it is today due to the sheer size of the place and easier access to the rest of the world. A different history would be written for Earth.